So welcome to the Required Podcast. As we head towards the end of the year, we've got um, a returning guest and um, really, really engaging character. So looking forward to this one, Nick Booth, who's the founder at Seventh Wave. Welcome again, Nick. Yeah. Morning, Andy. How are you doing today? Yeah, good. Thank you. Um, definitely, I, I think looking down the towards the end of the year and, um, you know, finishing on a high and getting getting this one over with. So, uh, yeah, that's... <laughs> That's me right now. Um, For those who um, don't know you, Nick, um, tell us what Seventh Wave do. Uh, Seventh Wave, so a leadership development company. So we've been going for about 14 years now. Um, We we basically take leaders or newly appointed leaders on a leadership development program that lasts six months. So one day a month over six months. Um, It's a whole program that starts from getting to know you. Uh, on the first day, then understanding the challenges of leadership. On the second, uh, days three, four and five, it's all about the toolkit for being a great leader. And on day six, six months in, um, you then present back to the SLT or the board or whoever on everything that you've learned, how you've applied it and how you're going to use it going forward to increase the profitability and engagement of the business you happen to be in. So that that's it. And we've, you know, we, we, we start, I started off on my own uh, back, back in, um, as I say, when I was just, just over 40. Um, and now we've got a team of eight. Um, and we're currently sitting on this year, probably 60 clients. And we've probably wow. run the seventh wave program now. We think getting close to a thousand times, you know, which is brilliant. And we've had over 10,000 client, uh, 10,000 people go through our program, which is, is scary, but also a great opportunity for us, which probably leads me on to what my role is now developing and going forward. So I was so going to say, because last time we spoke, you were very much, you know, founder, but, you know, going out, leading it, doing the, doing the do, but um, you, you've, you've moved upstairs now, you've packed your boots up and, uh, <laughs> Well, I really get uncomfortable because it sounds really magnanimous, but that we we did make a bit of a a bit of an error, I would say. So during that time, what we'd do, we'd kind of go in there, work with the company, train the team up, and then shake them on the hands, group hug, and then get off to our next client. And from a BD perspective, it was appalling, really, because what we weren't doing is ever going back to those clients and saying, "Right, how are you getting on? What's worked? What hasn't worked? And you know, and can you recommend us to anybody else?" So. Even though I'm probably ten years behind the curve, we, we are. What I and the only person that can probably really do that at the moment is me to go back to those historical clients and pick up with them and to see how they're doing. Because you know, part of our business model, which we've kind of worked out as well, is a lot of those people ten years ago. Take Jim Denning, for example, who's now the CEO of LHI. You know, he was one of our. You know, he was on my course ten years ago. Or Steve McBride, who runs Discover. You know, this he was on my course in hydrogen. So we find a lot of these people have moved on, developed, set up different businesses, and set their own up. So we, I have got the time now because my team are doing such a brilliant job to go back and actually engage with these clients to see if they need anything else from us. Um, which is ironic because probably 50% of our work is in recruitment. And when I tell them what I'm thinking of doing, they're kind of looking at me like going, Nick, seriously, you might be able to do leadership, but you need to work on your BD. <laughs> so that's it. I, I guess it's one of those things, isn't it? If, you know, you, you, you don't always sort of practice what you preach. And, yeah, I think one of, one of the things that I found really difficult um, when I started running a business was doing the things that you know you've got to do, but you don't necessarily, you just put them off. And yeah. you know to do the things you really yeah. are doing. So, yeah, it's uh, it, it comes to everyone as well. But it's it's, it's tough sometimes. Yeah, it's it's different and it's weird. I mean, I adore our program, and I, uh, you know I'm a true advocate of it, obviously. But on workshop six, when you see that team getting the certificates, getting through the accreditation of IOL, it's it, you know selfishly it's a buzz. You know, you get a lot from it, and then you wave goodbye and move on. And and it is, and I will miss that to some degree. I'm sure I'll do some of it every now and again, dip my toe in. But the team we've got around us now do, do a great job at that. And I, I am enjoying this. You know, I'm getting used to it. I'm learning new skill sets, you know, and and that's a great thing for me. What I'm I'm 58 now, you know, so I'm still learning new things on how to develop and, and develop that side of it. So I'm thinking, and I, one of the biggest things we talk about in our world, in our training sessions, is the doing, managing and leading. And I've been very much doing and managing for quite a while. So now the leading phase is something that I get get into. But yeah, I often don't practice. I often call myself a smoking doctor. I like I tell people to stop smoking. Yeah, I'm smoking myself. And it's a little bit like that. So yeah, it's uh, it's it's something I'm learning, which is and that in itself is super exciting. You know, 
Yeah, I can imagine. You know what? I almost imagine your role now is a bit like Gordon Ramsay, you know, when he does his kitchen <laughs> nightmares. So, you know, he goes and sets it all up. And then then what he does, he goes back three months later and finds out what, you know, the, the results yeah. were as well. Yeah, absolutely. Hopefully. Yeah. And so what are you seeing at the moment? And it's interesting because you're a great bellwether, right? So you're 50% recruitment, 50% normal companies. Um, so I'll use that. I yeah. use that ad, um, <laughs> advisedly. So, so what are you what are you seeing out there at the moment? And because um, my my challenge at the moment is, I'm seeing a lot of businesses that have been beaten. Um, so recruitment specific here, been beaten. Sure. They've had a really tough eighteen months, maybe even two years. Very weary. And the thing that I've started seeing is people have stopped investing in themselves and. It feels very, it's probably a natural thing to do that sort of hunker down, you know, we protect, you know, you know, we've got our cash, you know, let's just survive. But also as well, it's a bit counterintuitive that now's a really good opportunity to invest. So what what are you seeing out there? It's it's really interesting, actually, because I I always be, be quite wary on what I'm about to say is that it almost becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy if we constantly go around saying the market's tough, the market's bad, and et cetera. Now, so one of two things happen. You either believe that to be true, right? And therefore, everything that is going to be bad is to happen to you will happen to you, right? Yeah. Or you could look at it from a completely different perspective. Now, some of the businesses I work with, let's just say recruitment businesses that are actually being rather successful at the moment, they're looking at this going, and actually, if my competitor is believing this to be true, they're going to do some changes and stuff and they're going to leave us with this market that is actually still there because people still need jobs and we still need to have commerce and trade and people need to be moving around. So the businesses that use that as a narrative now in a negative way is pretty damning because what they'll do is they'll start to believe it and everyone starts to become woe is me and the attach around the coffee machine becomes, you know, it's really hard. Isn't it? It's really hard. Yeah. But the businesses that I work with that are not looking at it that way, that look at it from a positive a positive opportunity, are the ones that are flourishing. And I think it always comes from the leadership. In other words, look, yeah, admittedly, this part of the industry is not recruiting anymore, but who is, you know? So who, where can we move? What can we do? What can we change? How can we look outward and not inward too much? And I think outward positively. And so I'm seeing a lot of that. If you start to believe the narrative, um, what happens, Andy, over time is it becomes it, it seeps through the business and then you'll get people procrastinating and sitting back in the chairs. And, oh, why do I ring that customer? That market's shocking. And I think and that we see a lot of that. So that's what I've, I've definitely seen that. Obviously, the reality post covid was it was low hanging fruit. It was easy money. There was there was a gazillion recruiters out there. And, and the reality is, you know, as things do, as that supply and demand changes, that therefore there'll be less now but the ones that are really working well are the ones that are investing and this is not a selfish act but investing in their team in terms of time and engagement and just spending time with them and and keeping that positivity going and and one of the things that i've noticed in works incredibly well is focusing on the team engagement which i think is so important and we've got a few clients around that, that work brilliantly that they focus on their identity and their engagement and when you get those two things right and you become like a, a true team, not a cult, but a team around it that can help each other, um, that's when you you start to see some real in, incredible wins, like real wins out there, you know, because no one's being selfish, no one's being, you know, everyone's helping each other genuinely. And that's that's good. The opposite of that, and I've been in two or three recruiters this week that were really nameless where they are literally in fighting. A job comes in and they're ripping it apart. And they're trying to, that's mine, I'll have it. That, yeah. And that's what it goes, that is the epitome of how not to do it, you know? Yeah, and it's almost that being calm in the face of, you know, that adversity, you know, it's just having that thing of, and knowing that, okay, we've been in these sort of downturns before, it will come back. Like like you say, the logical thing is, you know, I saw some stats the other day that anywhere between 20 to 30% of people have left the industry. So when yeah. it does come back, you know, or even now it's, it's right-sizing itself. So the market opportunity, you know, jobs aren't down 20, 30%, you know, but if, you know, so the, there is still the the market opportunity. If you look, there's still a skills shortage in a lot of industries as well. So I think if people, like you say, it's almost like you need to, 
get out of that sort of echo chamber and yes. just run your own race. Yeah, absolutely. I remember when the oil and gas the oil crash a few years ago. I think it was about eight, eight or nine years ago. You probably remember it well. Yeah, uh, we, I, we, I remember it because we'd done our whole strategy was based around oil and gas <laughs> and extracting it from places that uh, you know a hundred dollars a barrel was you know that really costed in. But yeah. when it goes to 50, 60, you know, no, no one's no one's taking it out of um no one's taking it out of funky places in Africa. Honestly, and, and that's exactly so. I remember walking into two recruiters that day. I walked to one in the morning, typical recruiter, 50 heads. There's a team leader on the desk with eight people, and he didn't have eight people. So I says, What's up? He says, Nick, I've recruited into oil and gas. You won't believe I've had to let all my team go. I'm just you know, I'm probably gonna have to leave my desk now and go to some of the and he was like, Oh, really heavy, very kind of low, depressed guy. That afternoon, I went over to another recruiter, and this guy was only had his team of six, and I high fived him. He says, "Nick, this is amazing." I says, "You recruited, greatest respect. You recruiting to all. I guess what? Why are you being so positive?" He says, "Because every one of my competitors are running for the hills, and all I'm doing, I'm picking up with the clients, the managers, the leaders out there, because that industry still exists. And guess what happens when the price goes back up? Because it's a natural resource, they're going to come back to me because I'll be present, and." And I was going, well, ain't that a bit of a gamble? He went, it may be, but trust me. And a year later, honestly, Andy, this guy was he was sitting pretty because he's not lost all those relationships he'd built. Admittedly, some people have been moved on in, in industry, but he had these core relationships that he was picking up from others, other companies that no longer wanted them, and he was bringing them into his fold and looking after them, and it all came back, you know? So it was it was, it was was a brilliant case study in a day of how to how to be and not to be, you know? Yeah, definitely saw that in COVID as well. So, you know, there were there were companies that furloughed all their sales staff. And, you know, the, the one thing you need to do is, you know, and, uh, you know, obviously hindsight's an amazing thing. But yeah. I, I remember the firms that didn't um, were picking up PSLs that they could have dreamed of before. Totally. And it, they, they were literally, their competition weren't answering the phone. Yeah. You know, yeah. and you know, exactly. you know, with with fifty percent, you know, I think sixty percent of recruiters on furlough, and the jobs went down by forty percent. It's a better market opportunity. Yeah. So, but I guess when you're in it, it, you get that sort of herd mentality of oh, everyone else is doing it, must must follow, yes. must follow them. Um, I, I definitely, I definitely think now is actually an opportunity as well because you're not just growing people for. You know, what will be a better market? I mean, you know, yeah. we're fairly sure that, you know, the market will come back, you know, or it's certainly not going to get any worse than it is now. We can't. Um, but actually having them, you know, like you say, deal with tough things in tough times. Yeah. And I think every, you know, I must have spoke to five or six CEOs over the last two weeks. Every single one of them said the market's on the turn. Every one of them is saying, we've had it tough. It's coming around. It's moving around. And I think, and then the cute ones in there, are the ones that are really working with their team. So you're talking this high level leading piece, but they're also getting back right down to desk level and going, how are you? Do you need, have you got everything you need? Are we looking after you? And creating this, like I said earlier, this team mentality around, are we ready to go to market? Are we ready for the upturn? And they're the ones that are investing at the moment in leadership development, you know, and, and and it's in, and they are the ones that are so emp- empowering because inspiring sorry and those people are not leaving, they're not leaving they're not being picked up by Rector X they're the ones that are actually sticking with this team because they they can see it you know and, and I don't want to give any names away but there's three clients I work with at the moment that are absolutely flying because of that mentality you know and that's not me that's their leaders we we are just we are we are oiling the machine you know the machine there the leadership the engagement they're driving the targets that everyone's involved in it's just so so but they're giving them the skill sets that they can do it at base level you know so they can actually have difficult conversations give tough feedback listen properly coach when they need to all of that stuff that is a definitive learned skill not something you pick up by osmosis you know I think something that really kept me um, engaged and, you know, still very, um, you know, my time at S3 was amazing because it didn't stop when you were just a consultant or a manager actually went on and, you know, went through a program at Henley Business School, really felt invested. And and it as much as it changed my career, it probably changed my life um, yeah. just in yeah. terms of um, actually just understanding myself, understanding how others saw me about how to work in teams and also as well, just really buzzing off the other 11 people that I, I yeah. went through um, that with. And it was a big cost, 
but it was also a huge investment. And I think any of my sort of peers that, you know, I think I was the second cohort. There was a, the first cohort really raved about it as well, but they talk about that time as, and, and actually enabled us to change the company. The project yeah. we did changed the company. It's so powerful. I think, so we talk a lot in our recruitment, well, in our, in our program about in and on. So what we mean by this is when times are tough, we tend to think in, right? We tend to think in the business. It's a bit like you lose your job, you know, oh my God, how are we going to pay for the mortgage? How we... So you're thinking in, right? During that time, if you can think on, right? Where are we in life? Where's the business going? Where are we heading? That is the pure, that is a real kind of game, um, a different, it makes a huge contrast between two. So the businesses that are thinking in on the daily basis, reacting to the moment, are okay, but the ones that can defy and actually think on. So when you was at Henley Business School, you'd have been thinking on. You'd have been going, where's this going? Where's my career going? Where's S3? I'm being invested in. And that's it. So in and on. And I think even in our lives, we need to do this. I'm coaching this afternoon and I'm popping to see a, a husband and wife, actually, that are kind of in mid-50s, you know, both board level. And they are, they tend to think to in. And I'm going to say, right, well, let's think on. Where do you want to be when you're 60, 70, 80? You know, so it's about that projected thought around, what you could have down there, down the river, you know, if you really thought about it. And businesses are the same, Andy. They'll, you know, they'll react to the moment and they won't think that that reaction is normally to a, a, a causal effect from within their own business. So let's stop that. Think above here and let's think about what's causing that behaviour down here, as opposed to dealing with the, the this problem all the time, as opposed to thinking about what this is. And I think that in and on mentality is difficult to do and things are tough, uh, but if you can do it, you know, and that's why sometimes going to Henley or I think Macro back in the day took me into, uh, we went up to the Lake District with a team called Impact. That was what it was. And we went up there and there was all general managers and we were all climbing and doing abseil and all that carry on. But you were away from the business so you could think about it a lot more, uh, a lot more strategically. I think one of my favourite anecdotes is, um, I think it was the guy's name's Maury, he was at Intel. And um the, the, the performance was really, really bad. And they thought, right, if this goes this way, we're going to get fired. Yeah. So, and they're going to bring in a new team. Yeah. And and actually they physically said, right, we're going to walk out the door and fire ourselves. And then we're going to walk back in and take fresh eyes on the business and do the things that we, we you know, the new team would do. Take those tough decisions, take yeah. those, you know, kill those sacred cows, et cetera, et cetera. And, and actually, you know, being able to look at your business in abstract is a really, really powerful thing. And like, like, like you say, you know, when I look at required and I look at Rex band, I probably, you know, uh, don't look at it in the same way as if I was advising someone else from the outside. Absolutely. And what I would say is there's, there's many great coaching questions we could ask you about that. We could say, you know, Andy, you know, thinking five years ahead, what would your future self say to you about, give you advice now, you know, and, all of this, or you go back five years, what could you have done differently? And all of these kind of questions allow you to think about it. But you've got to create the state for you to think like that. If I was talking, and I know your background now, but if I was saying to you where you're going on holiday, but that sofa behind you was on fire, you would not be able to answer my question properly because you'd be going, oh, my God, the sofa's on fire. And it's it, we can only, reality in reality, we have to sometimes change our environment to create that thought, kind of that thought space to think about what the future could look like for us as a business, you know, as opposed to reacting to the moment. And and that's a process. We have to vent. Yeah, but, you know, Charlie didn't do a deal yesterday. Da, da. Okay, get that all out of your system, right? Now let's go to a restaurant, sit down for a coffee. What does the future look like? And then you can start thinking on the business. But you have to, you have to vent. We're humans, you know, things get in the way, things make us react, you know, and then move away, think about what it is and, and, and get someone good to facilitate that conversation. What's the biggest difference you see between, I'm going to call them normal companies and recruitment companies again? What's what's the big difference? I, look, I've, I, and I'm not blowing smoke here. I love recruitment. I'd never used to. I genuinely had, I used to be headhunter when I was in retail and I had, a, you know, I was the best mate for a day and then they'd never hear from me. You know, I'd never hear from them again and all that stuff. Smash and grab. I fell in love with recruitment. I, you know, when I first was in hydrogen and I spent some time with LHI and I realized that there's there's three or four factors that recruitment teaches you. One, it's resilience. Number one, a good recruiter develops resilience, like hard, just unbelievable. The other one is emotional intelligence. They become chameleons. They can react in the moment, you know. And the third one is the reward, that if you work hard, 
you can get this. You can become seriously rewarded. Um, and I think it's the grit and the grind in recruitment, the successful recruiters from from single recruiters, like first day on the desk to CEOs. The, the one common factor that I see within all of them is the ability to grind it out, is the ability to sit there and we call it core hours. You can call it what you like, but I just call it grit and grind. If they just sit there and just, just work it and have the ability to do that. Now, if we could take that into industries outside, and there's elements of it, don't get me wrong, but they honestly, that's where they could learn so much from the recruitment industry. Can and you I think with that, civil service with the recruitment mentality. Say that again. Can you imagine the civil service with the recruitment oh. mentality? <laughs> I mean, it's a difficult one. And I, I, you know, I often talk about when we do training rooms, I never talk about religion, politics and all the NHS. Like, I get really. <laughs> but there is honestly, there is so many industries. Manufacturing is one. There's, you know, there's a sales team we work for um, that we did recent work for. And we looked at this sales team and they were just procrastinating every minute of every day. And they've got a brilliant product and they would make them gazillions if they sold it. But you know what? They wonder in about half nine. They wonder out about they're not that bothered, you know. And I'm like, oh, my goodness. You know, and I could take one recruiter, an average recruiter, put them in that business and they'd smash it, like smash it. They'd just go. It would be like Wolf of Wall Street when he goes into that share options. It's a bit like that, you know, uh, probably a bad analogy, but it's true. And you, that's the difference. And I think that's why I think it's such a wonderful industry. I think it teaches people so much. I, I, there is a danger, though, within it. I think there's an age limit and I've got to be very careful what I say now because you can probably pick loads of examples where not, but I think it's a bit like Premier League footballers. They get to a probably 30, 35 and that's when they really should be leading others and that's in developing teams underneath them as opposed to just kind of trying to still do it themselves um, because as the, the Gen Zs come through, they will become better recruiters than you will ever have been because it's a new industry. They'll be using chat GPT, they'll be using all the new stuff that's coming out that we don't understand. Well, I can say me, not you, Andy. Yeah, I think for me, whether it's an age thing or whether it's an energy thing and, and an experience thing as well, I think um, certainly when I started, you know, I'd be a classic, you know, I, was, um, I was, wasn't I was quite a straight grad. I'd, I'd done a year as president of Students Union at Reading University, which was amazing grounding to uh, <laughs> where, I learned, where I learned a lot. So coming into a sales job was just, you know, it was no responsibility. It was amazing. Just get on yeah. and just be, be yourself. But I think, I think, you know, for me as well, the the energy you need to to learn and then get to that sort of ten thousand hours, and then yeah. you become smart in how you deploy that energy, and then the idea is you become a leader is you can you know effectively make other people smarter. Yeah, that's it, and I think that's 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 brilliant. Touching, it's not being selfish. I think it's actively giving away your knowledge. And that's where we see the true leaders within recruitment, if you're talking recruitment, that that truly let their team flourish. They give their secrets away willingly. You know, they're, they're helping. And also, the reason we exist as a business is that we saw back in the day, these newly appointed recruiters would be on desk given 18 months and suddenly they're giving one or two people to lead. And they go, hang on a minute. Now I'm having to deal with these two. I can't get on the phone and make money. I'm losing money. And these two are nightmares and now starting to complain about me to my boss. You know, so it's a, it's like a, a double edged, it was double edged bad sword, really. So what we what we reason we exist is how do we get this person to become a leader really quickly to help these people engage and make money for them. But we do see them dip in terms of income as they go into through this lead. But the curve at the back when you're managing eight or nine fantastic recruiters on your desk, you know, there's this this girl I work with in New York. She earned four hundred and fifty thousand dollars last year as a bonus, you know, and and you know on top of her base salary, and she runs a team of nine, and she's brilliant, and she's so unassuming. She just does her job. She sticks to some core beliefs, and that's it. And and it's life changing sums of money. This is that you can you can achieve in your industry, you know, which is just brilliant. You know, no, I think I think you're absolutely right, and I think you know recruiters. I I actually think as well that there's there's a very thin pyramid, and there's a lot of people that've been in rec you know a core of people who've been in recruitment years and years and years, but a lot of people drop off maybe yeah. a year or two. And you talked about grit earlier. Um, uh, someone once told me, um, no one ever fails at recruitment; they just give up. Great spot, yeah, absolutely. 
And I think if you can find that, if you can find a way of just taking it and grinding it out every day. But if you, you know, it's interesting because other industries do have this, but they don't perceive it in the same way. Mm. Say if you're a, a Tesco's general manager, you walk around your shop every day, you're grinding it out, you're grinding out. So it's just a mentality thing. You say, you know what, 10 till four, core hours, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to do my job. And, and I think what happened with COVID, which is really interesting, by the way, because COVID, everyone could suddenly, everyone was at home. So people could pick up the phone and have chats with recruiters without worrying about the boss being over the shoulder or whatever. Yeah. Right. So now the good recruiters are going, actually, we need to move back to this later hour business. We need to start working like five, six, seven o'clock so we can talk to people like we did in COVID. Again, and that's the adaptability from your industry that people that are being successful do do, you know. So that's that's another interesting concept about the fact that I'm not going to do what I'm, I'm doing, what I'm told, but I'm also going to adjust it so I can make some of these deals. I think one of the interesting things for me as well is um, recruitment firms getting the balance between, you know, they, they're going to their investment. And I, th- I see a lot of push towards tech um, right now. And I think I think some people are searching for silver bullets, um, yeah. but I think it's about getting that blend right. Um, when I was learning golf, I spent a load of money on clubs. Yeah. And, you know, as I'm hitting it left, hitting it right, the guy who was a good golfer I was playing with, it goes, spend as much on lessons as you did on your clubs or just split it. You'd be a much yeah. better, much better golfer. And okay. it, was good analogy. It, was, it was absolutely right. So I think having, you've got to have that, that blend, I think, of, of investment. Yeah. I think you also need to blend where you spend your time. I Tech zoom all of the stuff is fantastic right emails i can i i could just i could get a, a program out there and i could email a million people about the benefits of seventh wave i could do it right and would it make me any money probably not right the yeah. best thing without a shadow of a doubt is meeting somebody face to face shaking their hand having a coffee chatting about the sun the moon the stars and then kicking about their world without trying to sell them anything and i think that to me we're pack animals andy we we like to be physically now around other humans you know and i think the ones that will work hard in that space recruiters and people like me are much happier and they get the results but they perceive it oh i've got to go into london just for one meeting for one coffee it's it's better for me than sending a thousand emails you know it's just it's just and and it's better for me it's it better for my soul you know, to do that you know and so i think that's important and again the people in your industry that genuinely are brilliant at it are the ones that can do both are the ones that can be at, well, analytical they can then go and meet someone they can engage with someone and those chameleons it sounds a bit disrespectful but the ones that can have the emotional intelligence to do that are the winners in that space that can turn it on like this you know yeah i i, I agree and i think one of the things that we've really found since covid as well we, we founded the network is that sense of community as well and yeah. you know working as a community for me it used to be recruiters used to be it was all you know very insular um and and yeah there were some groups before but covid really you know like it's it's not it's it's us against you know you know extinction as opposed to us against yeah. others so I, I think as well what i really see in the communities is 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 a difference there's there's those you know, we set up the communities, but you know, by no means are we the top contributors now. This this thing has grown; it, it's organic, and you you actually see some leaders within. Um, you see some leaders within the industry, which is really easy to see. You see it on LinkedIn as well. You know, yeah. who you know, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And yeah, it's it, it's very obvious to see. But you're right. I mean, I was at a Rec Expo last week. Um, I'm I'll be at contracting awards. You know, and and actually, those human interactions just make all the difference. Oh, they do. And you remember them forever. You know, you genuinely remember, oh, we had lunch there or we did this yeah. or that. Guy. And you start to see the be- below the surface of the, you know, the, the CEO, you start to see them as a, as a human being. What does she do? What does he do? You know, you understand them and start to connect with them. And it makes, it makes in- an incredible difference. I think the, the other, you asked me about trends earlier. I think the other trend that I'm seeing is where, and it's, it's similar to what we spoke about in terms of engagement, but it's when you're non-adaptive to change. When a business will go, that's the model we've always had, and that works. Yep. And I think it's when people are non-adaptive to changes where the businesses fail, because very often ego gets in the way or pride. When they actually sit back and go, okay, that worked for five years, what could we do now? And how do we change the business model? That's when you start to see a difference. So you do get some stalwarts who will just not change, 
But when you are adaptive to change and start to make that change easier for everybody and en engage the whole team in the change, that's when you start to see some wins. And you do see a little bit of two camps out there, you know? So but businesses... Change, change is scary. <laughs> it is. Change is scary. And yeah, sure. yeah I, I guess... I guess you see that, but how do you break that down? How do you break down? Because you know, I'll 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 speak to people, and they've been doing what they're doing for 10, 15 years. It's been successful. Chances are, if they, you know, it'll be successful again. But yeah, how do you, how do you break that? I it's a really good it's a really good spot. I think that I I used to work for a boss, and I, every time I go in with an idea, a crazy idea to him, he'd say he'd ask me three questions. He says, "How much is it going to cost me?" What's the most I could lose and what's the most I could gain, right? And that was it. And and those three questions are really good. So, look, if we look, boss, you know, I want to go into this new market. Okay, how much is it going to cost me? What's the most I could lose? What's the most I could gain? And when you actually start to think about that, it, you can de-risk it quite quickly. And you can say, let's go through change. Let's see what we do. Let's test it out there and just be aware of it. What I would say, and it is the typical change curve, when you take any business through change, you'll get that initially, that shock or denial, people will say, we can't be changing and then you go through this this almost anger resentment thing or oh, we never used to do it like this it's but why are we changing there's no need it's that anger resentment piece here right that if you get your team to through and that and that the best way of doing that is collectively and involving everybody mm -hmm. and then you get into the acceptance stage and then the exploration and then you move through to success so as you take people through the change curve it's like you just said your immediate reaction was it's scary and my immediate reaction to you will be, so why is it scary? And tell me an example where it scared you. So you then you can dissolve it and dilute the fear to see what's through the other side. And then you manage the risk. You go, okay, we've got a team of 50. We're going to take this team through a new change, a, a new way of working. We're going to keep these guys here. And that's what you do. So you manage it. and But also recognize success. And a lot of this stuff is longer term. It won't be immediate, but you've got to hold hold your metal. I'm going through change at the moment. I'm doing a different role in, in seventh way, which is scary for me, you know, and I'm working through my own personal change curve, which is super exciting. But at the same time, I'm aware of it. And when I start thinking in, I've got to think more on, you know, when I go through that. And, and I know speaking to Steve, that was very much a, this is a strategic decision. This is what we're going to do. You probably, you know, as a team, you, you all agreed that and you were going to do that because, you know, again you know everyone else's roles will suddenly change as well so you yeah. know they'll have to step up they'll have to change because of you know the, the gap but i get yeah but change is difficult I, I used to joke that you know i used to work on change projects and i really hated change so <laughs> you know i quite liked you know what we, what we used to have and how it was it, it felt safe so you know it's it's, diff, it's difficult what to do say is it, it is but on on day two we talk about change we do the change curve and we use the book there that's behind me who moved my cheese right so who moved my cheese it's been around since the 60s and there's a video on youtube and i honestly it's a 20 minute video it's a little bit edgy and, and in terms of just quality is a bit rubbish but it's for recruitment i think it's one of the best videos ever right you've got ham and whore and you've got these two little mice scratchy and itchy or something right and these two mice shoot off into the maze every day looking for new cheese all the day da, da, da. And you've got Ham who's just going, actually, I don't want to change. My cheese is here. I'm going to keep going back to that cheese. And the analogies are brilliant, right? Because you realise you've got to be an amalgamation between the two, you know, all the time. And that makes change easier. You know, Max makes cheese, cheese <laughs> makes change easier, you know. But honestly, who moved my cheese? Video on YouTube. Watch it because you, then you can look around the office and you'll go, yep. Yeah. I can see that. Send me the link. I'll send me the link. I'll bring it out. It's a brilliant. And, that, and what we do in the program, I always buy the books. I'm with a client next week. There's 15 of them in the room, or 15 books, to like, you know, a couple of quid each. They're all going to get a book. And there you go. And it's because it, this to me is vital, especially for recruitment. You know, but you've got to have Every time they see that book, they'll think of seven ways. Totally. Yeah. And, and hopefully they'll be thinking, what do I need to do differently today? What, you know, where's the other pockets? Where do I need to go? You know, because I can't rely on this client because this client could bang, fold tomorrow and I'll be out, out the door. So ask yourself. And the other thing is, on that basis, what helps you with change, I believe, is asking yourself some very robust what if questions. So the reason for I'm changing, if I what if I kept doing delivery into my 80s? Right. And there's a lot of people in my world 
that have got these models that they and they I've seen old boys falling to sleep at the corner of the training room, you know, because they're like still hanging on during the training. So what if questions are sometimes so what if we don't change? What if we don't embrace chat GPT? What if we don't embrace Gen Z? What if ask those questions? Because trust me, if you want to the pow, most powerful thing to get you through the change curve is a why. If you've got the why at the here, you'll get through the change curve a damn sight quicker, honestly. You know. Yeah, and, and I think I think the other thing just sort of reminded me in this conversation is I think people do change um when they have you know often too late because they have to yeah and it's <clears throat> like you know the analogy of a recruitment company is right our sales have been rubbish for a year we're going to go out of business let's try that you know we'll change now but maybe it's too late you know your yeah. analogy of uh, I'm an 80 year old trainer you know <clears throat> didn't change 20 years ago um but now it's too late I can't <clears throat> I can't yeah. go and, you know so so actually I think that identifying and getting ahead of the curve because you will have to change. And, you know, most people change because they have to, or they are forced upon them, but the yeah. best time to do it is when you, when, when you choose to. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, so I was asked a very good question a few years ago. So I was doing a lot of work for, um, for Faden at the time. I was going over to, to New York many, many times. And, and one of my kind of close friends or coach, she said to me, what if you couldn't travel anymore? And she says, "What?" She's joking. So, what if your legs fell off and you couldn't do any more training? And it asked me some really good. I thought, "Wow, you know," because I believe in any business, you should never have a single point of failure yeah. ever. So, if you have got a single point of failure in your business, whether that's a million dollar bill or a great admin, whatever it is, or a CRM, whatever it is, you've got to be prepared to think about what that would look like if it wasn't there. So, at the time, I was a single point of failure. So, we had to. We had now. We've got seven incredible trainers. So, if I was doing some delivery on Monday and I couldn't, Steve, Darren, Jancis, any one of them could jump in and do it, right? Yeah. So we that is sewn up. But by me, by Zelda asking me that question, it made me completely change my business model and bring other people in that could do what I did. And it took three or four years to get it right. But now, you know, Darren was over in New York last week doing a doing the workshop six for a client and it was just wonderful. So yeah, so it is what if questions, Andy. Ask yourself some what if questions, you know? And that sometimes initiates positive change and then he initiates positive conversations to be more on than in so last question for you and um what's the one what if question that recruitment leaders should ask themselves following watching this okay i would say what if you lost your best recruiter Nick, it's been a real pleasure as always. Um, really enjoy talking to you and the team. I actually come out of it. Um, I, I feel like, I, you know, as much as a podcast, I think I've got, got a free coaching session. <laughs> That's <laughs> That's I do free coach. <laughs> so it's, it's been really good. Um, if people want to learn more about Seventh Wave, obviously we'll put the details in, but how can they find you? And yeah, just, just jump on our website. With you? Yeah, 100%. Listen, I'll have a coffee with anyone, give some free coaching. So yeah, just jump on our website. You'll find us as a, there's, a, there's a, a contact us link so just jump on there drop me an email or give me a call and we'll have to have a chat you know so we give this stuff away for free so you know it's all about trying to help as many leaders as possible across the world so yeah absolutely just give me a shout fantastic and we've got some required offers coming up that um we're gonna um we're gonna be rolling out in the next few weeks as well so um yeah an opportunity to work with the team at seventh place um nick thank you so much again and um we'll catch up soon it's a pleasure thanks andy